Just before we begin this video, I'd like to let people know that by becoming a patron or donating £5 or more, you'll be given special access to my unreleased review on Western anime theme songs. Links in the description below. Hello everybody, my name is Nick Starwin and welcome to part 3 of our special, where in celebration of the one year anniversary of The Missing Coach part 3, I have decided to spend every week of this month looking at the plethora of Thomas the Tank Engine games. In our last video we moved away from Amiga and DOS and looked at what Nintendo and Sega had to offer, with two solid contributions from Genesis and Game Boy Color and one giant disappointment on the Super Nintendo. The less I say about that, the less chance of nightmares for you. Remember to check out parts 1 and 2 of our special in the links below or on my channel and remember to like, share and subscribe to keep yourself up to date. Also, don't forget that for the games we cover each week, we will be playing them over on my Twitch channel every Thursday at twitch.tv slash starwindstreams to give you a better look into the variety of games we will be covering. So, with that being said, let's grab our keyboards once again and head back onto PC and dive into the inconsistent world of CD-ROM interactive games, with some fun, and not so much fun, contributions to Windows 98. So, after the releases of games such as the adventure series on SNES and Genesis, excluding a bunch of other Japanese exclusives, the UK and US scene was pretty quiet for a while, and excluding a cancelled PlayStation 1 game in 1999 by RuneCraft and Infograms, it wouldn't be until that same year when Hasbro Interactive and Mind's Eye Productions released what would kick off a weird PC trend with Thomas and Friends The Great Festival Adventure. I remember when seeing this game in shops and instantly begging to buy it, as this was the first Thomas game I had ever come across and with recently getting a Windows 98 computer, our first proper home computer, aside from playing Cartoon Network Flash games and Frog in a Blender, I was so excited to play this. Looking back on it now, much like the people who commented on my views about the SNES game, I think because I had no other options available to me, this was in my view at the time, the best Thomas game ever made. Which, in fact, it was literally just a mini game -a but unlike the SNES game, this presentation is a lot better. The Great Festival Adventure takes place during Season 5 and involves you helping Thomas and the gang prepare for a special festival by doing a selection of mini games around the island, ranging from the basic matching of shapes and sizes to the more interactive games such as fixing the engines and controlling a big band scene at the end. Each mini game has its own unique CGI cutscene to divide them, utilising the model series style, including fun animations of the figurines, with the fat controller surveying the game throughout, instructing you on how to play. The mini games are not difficult, but with each one you have three stages to earn a certificate, gradually increasing in difficulty, which gives good variety to children playing it, either by just doing one level at a time, or going through all three stages to get the maximum playtime and that juicy certificate. There actually isn't a lot wrong with this game, but I'd say it's heavy going getting through it, as there is a lot of lag which may have been my copy of the game, but it really shows its age where you're waiting ages for an interactive segment to finish so you can do the next part, especially during the cranky loading game where you have to wait for him to pick up a piece, place that piece and return to the original position, which even I remember finding painful as a kid so I'm not getting nitpicky in my older age. When you do eventually get to the end of the game and complete all the tasks, you can go into the Fat Controller's office and print not only your certificates, but both colouring sheets and fully rendered pictures of the minigames and characters, which at the time was a pretty fun feature to have, making sure you got the most out of the game. Going back to it, there was obviously some nostalgia there for it, but I believe if I had some of the previous games given to me beforehand, I may have looked at this much differently. But, regardless of what I believe now, the game was clearly a success as one year later, we got a sequel. Trouble on the Tracks, also developed by Hasbro Interactive and Mind's Eye Productions, has a more character-focused story compared to the first game, where, because of a coal shortage, James is sent out to retrieve more from the mine, and because of his extensive experience into getting into accidents, automatically falls off the rails. Thus, the railway falls into panic as you have to get the engines working again, find James, and get him working too. The game is pretty much the same formula as before, 
You get a number of tasks, you have three levels of difficulty per task to gain a certificate, but whereas before the tasks range from story based ones to more random ones, all of these are interconnected to make a more linear experience, but with the same freedom to pick any you like from the map screen. This is a much better game and definitely an improvement on the original with a vast variety of gameplays to work with, whether it's navigating the island as Harold, matching cogs for the breakdown train, loading the right weighted cargo into trucks, although this one pisses me off because the trucks jerk you about and the lag just adds to the frustration, all climaxing to fixing and cleaning James before starting him up and sending him back to work, showing a fun level of game progression. The layout stays the same, the cutscenes are still just as good as before, and if you cared at all, you can print off even more colour sheets and certificates to add to your collection or job applications. Because trust me, they won't be able to reject me when they see I have my Master Lemp Shelver certificate. If you are going to give these games a go, I would recommend starting with Trouble on the Tracks first and working backwards, as it is a much more enjoyable game, and my child self must have agreed with me because I seem to have kept a hold of my trouble on the tracks disc and the former being completely lost. Sadly though, this would be the last game in the series that Hasbro Interactive would be a part of, before all of its respect was lost when Thomas and the Magic Railroad Print Studio was released in the same year, and Infogrounds would acquire not only the company, but take over development of the PC titles, with Mind's Eye Productions developing one more game a year later. So rather than make a third game in the series, Mind's Eye Productions decided to take the game in a different direction and in 2001, Thomas and Friends Railway Adventures was released on PC. Railway Adventures is a very different game to the previous two, as for starters it comes with an attachment for your keyboard, good luck laptop and Mac users, that gives you a more hands-on interactive approach to the game. What is quite unique about this game is the exploration aspect where you control Thomas as if you're his driver, going around the island in this point of view shot, changing signals to go onto different lines to either access stations, do various tasks, play mini games that get unlocked as you progress, and even these cutscenes recapping on popular episodes. Much like before, the game has a varying range of difficulty and a good level of variety within each task one involving picking up items, another sorting through mail bikes at the depot station, and one very interesting level which involves you travelling to Kuldi Fell to fix bridges, making it the second time in a game based on the television series to feature this railway, first one being the use of the station Shiloh in the Genesis game, despite them never bringing the mountain railway to the show. There are four main levels for you to complete in the game, and four mini games that are unlocked which you find outside the stations when you explore. Although the minigames aren't really all that varied as they just involve a top down view either collecting trucks or racing one of the characters. But despite this, the variety we already had from the main game makes up for it, even if they had to sacrifice graphics and cutscenes to give us more content as in some aspects it is a downgrade from the previous two, but nevertheless it is a solid game in my opinion. Except for the voice acting, because... What a good driver you have, Thomas. Hello, Trevor. What are you doing here? Nothing. I'm going to the harbour. Is there anything I can get for you? Yes. That one's for me. It's a good job Thomas found the mail truck. Isn't it, Percy? Yes, Edward. Poor little Thomas. He can't go as fast as I can. It was a very important job bringing all those supplies from Brendam Station. I love how Michael Angeles is just shouting down the microphone while two other voice actors, Stephen Donald and Simon Hetworth, give these very soft and creepy interpretations to the other characters. I feel with these reviews so far we either get a horrific gameplay, terrible presentation and an overall bad experience, or we get a brilliant game but with the most shocking graphics or downright awful audio. You just can't seem to win. Excluding that though, Railway Adventures is definitely the best to have come out during this time for PC, and showed a lot of potential for what we could have had from a Thomas game moving forward for the UK and US market. As I have already stated before, the Japanese seem to be getting on just fine with their exclusives and saw no need to share their goodies with us. After Railway Adventures, development for future games would be moved over to Stunt Puppy Entertainment and a year later we would get another instalment to the Thomas & Friends PC library with the game Building the New Line. And it is boring as hell. 
What the goddamn hell? You had a perfectly good model to work from, you are pretty much using the same assets from the last game, and instead of capitalizing on that, and the fact you've got a unique control that could have been perfect for resale for its sequel, you make this bargain bin train set simulator. This game is agonizing to play. All you do is pick an engine, choose the most basic of track layouts, build it, and watch a low quality JPEG float around the set, doing bare minimum tasks, while music from either the previous game or directly ripped from the show itself play on a loop in the background. After you've done that, you do half of a cleaning and fixing mini game because it only expects you to do half of the work and finishes it off before making a lame parade set piece and that's it, job done. This is beyond lazy. Why did we go from good to great to near brilliant and back to adventure series Super Nintendo quality of game? It is such a poor attempt after such a good game before it and they just thought, yep, this will do and shove it out to the public without a care. If you wanted to create a train set simulator, you could have incorporated the keyboard attachment and gone into that point of view mode and controlled one of the engines going around it when it was completed. It wouldn't have been that impossible considering all the track layouts were preset and there wasn't exactly much freedom to begin with, making this at least a decent added bonus. This was once again another example of one step forward, 20 steps back, and it would only get worse from there as Infograms would become Atari SA and put out Thomas Saves the Day in 2003, which is the lobotomized version of the Great Festival Adventure, bringing an end to this particular era of Thomas games before going downhill even more. And that was four games, with two life-sucking experiences, one good game, and one even better addition to make up for it. Now, I have probably missed out a few other PC games on that list, but they are either the exact same as the first three, or have even less to offer if you can believe that, especially after that last game, which I feel would just have me repeating myself, and that would never do. If you would like to see more of these games, then remember to check out my Twitch channel in the links below every Thursday of this month. But until then, that is the end of part 3 of our anniversary special. I hope you enjoyed it and tune in for next week's episode where we will be concluding our special with a variety of both the obscure and the contemporary from not only the western market, but also Japan. As always, to remember to like, share, subscribe, stick it on a badger, attach to a brick, mail it to a bomb because it like a surprise, and if you can, spare some change, governor, by donating the links below. And remember, by becoming a patron or donating £5 or more, you get access to the unreleased review on Western anime themes. But until then, I've been Nick Starwind, you have been my audience, and I shall see you next time.